in very shortly. Welcome to today's new app web webinar, Expert Advice for Judges, How to Handle U-Visa Certification and T-Visa Endorsement Requests. Today's web conference is presented by the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, new app, in partnership with the State Justice Institute, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Pleasure to have people joining us today. Please note that the project developed under this project was developed under grant number SGI 13E199 from the State Justice Institute. The points of view expressed are those of the authors, not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the State Justice Institute. So I do want to welcome everyone to today's session and have you being able to join in this conversation about this very important topic. I want to briefly familiarize you on how to use this technology. The first thing I want you to do is raise your hand. If you look above my picture on the far left, you'll see a little hand that says my status. Go ahead and do that and just raise your hands. We can have people raise their hands. There will be times that we will be asking for you raise your hand to answer certain questions in, um, um, in the today's session. Great. I see that we've got 30 of you have uh, raised your hands. So, um, from, okay, great. Well, I'm going to lower everyone's hands, and we're going to go on to the next piece of this. And that works. There is a text chat. Text chat. You would be able to do it by taking here and clicking on this. I want everyone to write in what city and state you're from, and why don't we share um, what the weather is today where you are. So go ahead and write in what the city and state and what um, the weather is where you are. Text chat away and go ahead and send that message in. Text chat so that we're able to get your feedback and your questions and learn what's going on. So I do know it's snowy in Jackson, Wyoming, extremely cold in Jefferson City, Missouri, um, cloudy in Los Angeles, California. It's yet in the 60s in Washington, D.C. And threatening rain in San Francisco, but warm and sunny in Tallahassee, Florida, um, and freakishly warm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and Conroe, Texas is wet and temperature is dropping. So thank you all for sharing what the weather is. If you, um, and I'm going to adjust my volume here because I understand I'm getting a little bit of breaking up. So we will be able to do that. So thank you very much. We also have some PowerPoint slides. That these slides are available on the new app website. And Rocio, if you can post the link to where people get copies right. of the slides and the resources. That will be great for people to be able to see what resources are available. So you will be able to get copies of everything. We will also have a recording of this web conference available, um, and that will be on the new app website. We will be asking several questions and polling questions, and all of your phone lines have been muted. You can ask your questions on the text chat. You can always send a private text chat by look, clicking on the private tab and sending a piece. I am getting a little bit of cracking on someone's phone line. Um, I'm not sure who that is. That might be you, Judge Livingston. If you can pick up your headset, let me just see if that works. My headset is in my hand. I believe that, that is sounding better. I was getting crackling. I'm sorry about that. But we will do that. If you have questions about the online, you can call you're I support at 800. Okay, yeah, thank you very up much. You, okay. Let me um, go ahead and adjust that. Okay, great. I am here. And so we will be um, iLink technical um, support at 800-799-4510. And thank you. All the materials have been posted. Um, Rocio um, Molina from New App has posted that. So thank you very much. I want to introduce the speakers um, who will be presenting today, and I'm um, really pleased to be joined with um, Leslie Orloff, who is the Director of the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, New Up at American University Washington College of Law. How are you doing, Leslie? I'm good, David. Thank you for hosting this. Oh, it's my pleasure. We're also really pleased to be joined by Scott Miller, who's the Educations Officer with the Office of Policy and Strategy. How are you doing, Scott? I'm good. How are you? Wait, you're getting to get a little bit of um, echo on you. Can you say oh, okay. I'm doing good, David. How are you? And everything sounds uh, okay on my end. Okay, 
once news to trafficking it comes in clear. We're also going to be joined by Judge um, Laura Livingston from Travis County Courts in Austin, Texas. Judge Livingston. Hi, David. How are you? Doing great. Well, a pleasure to be able to have all of you here to be able to present on this important topic. Let's first get a little bit of a sense of who's in our audience. So what I'm going to do is post in the left-hand side an A, B, C, or D. Let us know if you are a lawyer. It's A. Go ahead and click on that. B, if you're a domestic violence or sexual assault advocate. C, if you are a judge or court staff. And D, if you are other. And what we are seeing is that people are responding. And go ahead and keep on responding. I will share the findings as they come live. We've got um, about two, about almost half of our audience are going to be um, lawyers. We are followed by about a quarter of our audience are domestic violence and sexual assault advocates, and that we um, have about 16% are judges or court staff, and about 6% are other. And if you're other, go ahead and write down what the other is. Um, someone asked is paralegal other. Yes, it is. So, and I understand there's still some fact going on with me. So, if you are on the phone, if you're um, we will have to try to see that. I'm a little unsure of what's going on with the um, sound. I am speaking on directly into the headset. So a great call for sharing where you were. Let's um, today's learning objectives. Um, we are going to have um, Judge Livingston. Can you just review what people are going to be getting by the end of this today's webinar? Absolutely. Thank you, David, and, and welcome to everyone to the webinar. Uh, what we hope you will. Uh, learn this afternoon uh, are several things. We hope we'll learn something from you as well. What we hope you will achieve is accurate information about the U visa process and uh, P visas as well. We're going to tell you a little bit about the legislative history and the le regulatory history and the purpose of the U visa and P visa programs. We hope you'll leave here with a better understanding of what uh, the Department of Homeland Security thinks about the UV program, and certainly what we hope to achieve today is a much better understanding of the judge's role in the UV certification and P visa endorsement process. We hope that you'll leave here understanding a little bit more about how U visa certification can promote overall justice in our system and fairness in our system. Uh, and we hope when you leave that you'll know just a little bit more about how to handle a request to sign a certification or an endorsement in family cases and civil cases and in criminal court cases. That's our plan. Well, thank you very much, um, Judge Livingston. So let's ask another question of the audience to just get a little bit more of a feel of you, what your experiences are. Yes, no. Have you worked on a case in which a judge has signed a U visa certification? So let's go ahead and yes or no. And put it in the left hand side, not the text chat. The left hand side. Have you worked on a case in which a judge has signed a U visa certification? And I am. Um, let me see. I am sharing the results, and as you can see, overwhelmingly, it's really interesting. Overwhelmingly, 80 over 80 percent have not worked on a case where a judge has signed a U visa certification. Interesting, Leslie. I'm, I'm actually as equally as interested in the 16 to 20% or 15% that have. So that's, that's good news, and we understand that relatively new that um, more people are getting certifications from law enforcement and prosecutors, but in drafting the U visa statute, Congress clearly wanted judges to be part of the certification process, and that's what we're here to learn about today. Well, great. Well, let's move to another question, Leslie. Um, it's just uh, a question about: are, are you aware? Let's ask our audience: Are you aware that judges can also sign a T visa endorsement? So let's go ahead and let us know: um, Are you aware that judges can also sign a T visa endorsement? So I think the people are voting as we speak, and it is live results, Leslie, so everyone is seeing that about 40% of our audience, 38% of our audience do know that. Great. And we're going to be talking about both of those here today. Scott? Well, great. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the, um, withdraw the, the, the piece, and I think we're going to move over to um, Scott Whelan, who's going to be talking about TNU visas and sort of the purpose and overview. And um, so, Scott, I'm going to hand the podium over to you. 
Great. Thanks, David. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we definitely want to get the word out to uh, not only judicial officials, but obviously the public as well about CNU visas. So again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and we're really looking forward uh, to this presentation. Uh, so go ahead, uh, going ahead and jumping on in, um, just a real brief overview on the TNU visas. Um, these provide uh, temporary status to alien victims who are victims of certain crimes, whether they be human trafficking in the T visa world or in the U visa world, we're looking at human trafficking and other qualifying criminal activity, and we're going to be diving uh, well into detail uh, on that as the presentation goes along. Now, this is also a tool for law enforcement agencies, such as police departments, you know, sheriff's departments, and federal law enforcement agencies such as FBI and ICE, uh, Department of Labor, and other organizations. Uh, but it's also a tool for prosecutors and judges. And Congress created these back in 2000 in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Uh, Congress found, and lots of people were testifying before Congress, uh, talking about how uh, alien victims were afraid to come forward and uh, report their victimization to law enforcement. And that can go for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, you know, language barriers, cultural barriers, fear of law enforcement, uh, whether it be um, United States law enforcement or immigration, uh, fear of law enforcement back in their home country. Uh, there's all sorts of different reasons why people were not coming forward and reporting their crimes. Uh, so this strengthens the ability of law enforcement and judges and prosecutors and other government agencies uh, uh, to allow victims to come forward, report their crimes, and allow these agencies to detect, investigate, prosecute, convict, and sentence um, certain, uh, uh, certain bad actors, obviously the criminals we're talking about here, um, in U visa qualifying criminal activities and uh, human trafficking. And of course, like we said before, this certainly encourages uh, folks to come forward and report their victimization to law enforcement. So, and, and just to give you a little background, when the, as part of the um, trafficking victims and, and, and the VAWA uh, that was passed in uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act and the Violence Against Women Act of 2000, when the law passed, then Senator Biden talked about the, the U visa and T visa protections of that bill as some of the single most important provisions of that bill. And that um, there was, that those provisions were passed with bipartisan support with the goal of, of advancing justice for victims, truly improving public safety, and avoiding the kinds of retribution that can happen when perpetrators can threaten deportation or immigration enforcement against victims. And that that was what was truly needed to bring perpetrators to justice. The, um, and that the, the goal, as Scott said, was to be able to encourage victims, trafficking victims and victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, stalking and other crimes, to be able to report and fully participate in the justice system process. Um, and that Congress believed that the reason for this is that, that encouraging crime victims and supporting them in, in their ability to come forward um, furthers the humanitarian interests of the United States. So we're just going to start off talking about a lot of times people perceive when they think about the Department of Homeland Security, they think about it somewhat monolithically as an enforcement agency. And since actually the, the first law that began to really change this in terms of crime victims was the battered spouse waiver that became law in 1990, but certainly the Violence Against Women Act provisions and a variety of different laws have created essentially three purposes of the Department of Homeland Security. To provide a path to lawful permanent residency and citizenship for lawful immigrants, non-citizen crime victims, and in many contexts, different contexts, children, to really encourage and promote family unity and to, and to remove, remove undocumented immigrants from the United States. So Scott, um, when an immigrant qualifies for a U visa or a T visa that is available to them to under, lo under law that Congress created for them, is, that, are, is, is what that person qualifies some kind of a preferential status? 
Uh, no, it is not. It is not a preferential status. Um, so Congress, uh, like we talked about before, Congress specifically created these visas for folks to come forward and uh, report their victimization to law enforcement. So these are specifically created by Congress. These are visas that were created by Congress, you know, passed by both houses and by the president, um, that allows folks to come forward. And if they're eligible for this benefit, they're they are then able to apply. Uh, you know, they're not. You know, with all the debate, well, with all the debates hearing about immigration and everything, this is this is something that Congress specifically created, so folks are not jumping in line. Uh, they're not, um, you know, they're not getting any type of preferential treatment. If they apply for either a T or U visa, and if they're granted that visa, they will then get that visa. Um, and there's a certain process. Congress created certain uh, statutes and regulation. Well, Congress created the statutes, and then we at DHS and USCIS obviously drafted the regulations. So these folks have specific avenues um, because they're cooperating with law enforcement uh, to be eligible uh, for these benefits. Doctor stating her limitations. So I recommended that she do that. Um, can somebody, can everybody who's not a speaker please mute their phones by hitting star six? Whenever you're ready. Be a I'm going to mute everyone's phone lines. Just one second. The speakers will unmute their lines. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Okay. Leslie, please press star six to unmute your line. I'm unmuted. Great. I'm on. Perfect. And we're back to Scott, I believe. Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, and, and so like I said, just to wrap up, um, this is this was specifically created by Congress. Uh, these victims, um, you know, have their own statutes that are available to them. If they meet these eligibility requirements, which we'll be going down, um, we'll be going down the list of those requirements here in a bit. Um, it is not a preferential status. It's a visa. Um, they are governed by the laws and the regulations of these visas. Uh, they have to not only meet all eligibility requirements, uh, but they also have to be admissible to the United States. Uh, there are certainly repercussions if they uh, discontinue cooperating uh, with law enforcement or discontinue um, cooperating at all during any part of the uh, judicial process. Uh, if they commit crimes down the road, uh, that kind of thing, obviously there'll be um, uh, there'll be repercussions for that as well. So uh, they're governed by their own set of statutes and their own set of regulations. So they they are on their own track, which was created specifically for them by Congress. David? Scott, why don't you go to the next slide? Okay, and then uh, go ahead and moving forward. So again, um, just very, very quickly, and all of, the, all of these forms can be found on our website, and we'll have that contact information up for you uh, as well. Uh, the T visas are granted on our Form 914, and our U visas are done on Form uh, I-918. Uh, USCIS, my agency, which is a sub-agency under the Department of Homeland Security, uh, we uh, we have the sole jurisdiction over doing the T and the U visas, so uh, this will be something that's done completely by USCIS. Uh, it's not an ICE benefit, it's not a Department of Justice benefit, or any other immigration or federal um, or federal uh, law enforcement agency. This is done specifically by USCIS. Now, if someone is granted a T or U visa, they've got certain benefits that go along with those. Um, so, if someone is granted, they will get their temporary status for up to four years. Now this is called a non-immigrant visa, so these do have a shelf life, which is why we have the four years up there. Once somebody is granted, they have that status that's available for four years. Um, however, down the road, Congress also created statutes, and we uh, uh, put, a, put together regulations uh, based on those, where somebody can apply for their green card uh, down the road. So they can apply for permanent residency in the United States based on the fact that they were awarded these visas. Uh, however, the visa itself is only good for four years. Um, now, if somebody is granted a T or U visa, so that principal victim gets, uh, gets that visa, they can apply for certain uh, immediate family members to also have status here in the United States. And if they are also granted, uh, they will be able to apply for and get their work permits so they can legally work here and pay taxes here in the States. Uh, just jumping forward very quickly, uh, we have a statutory cap. Congress put a cap of 5,000 on the T visas. 
Now we've never come close to hitting that cap, um, and it's not because of the fact that TVs has, have a very high denial rate or anything like that. It's just we haven't seen the amount of petitions come in that get that rise to the level of 5,000. Um, the most that we've done in a fiscal year was last year, and we were around 900. Um, so that just shows um, the the, uh, the lack of uh, petitions or applications that are coming in for T status. Uh, however, on the U visa side, while we have a statutory cap of 10,000 for the U visas, we've hit that cap now uh, six years straight. When I first started, to, to, to kind of put it in perspective on how um, how the program has grown and how more law enforcement agencies are utilizing um, are utilizing the the U visa process. Uh, when I first started five years ago working on this program, we were getting um, we were getting roughly between eight to nine hundred uh, petitions per month. Uh, right now, we're getting over two thousand. Um, so, you know, doing the math on that, we're getting roughly around twenty five to twenty six thousand um, U visa petitions per year. Um, now, with that, obviously, we run into the cap all the time. So we get to that 10,000 limit. Well, what do we do? Uh, we do have a wait list process that's uh, spelled out in regulation. Um, so people can still apply for U visas. Um, so it's not, that we, it's not that we stop working. Our officers are still working. They're still going over everything. And we're still accepting uh, U visa petitions, um, even though we've hit that cap. Now, if we go over a U visa petition and um, we go through everything, and we can approve this person. So they've passed their background checks. Um, they've got that law enforcement certification in there. Uh, they've met every eligibility requirement there is for a U visa, and we want to approve it, but we can't because we're fresh out of visas. What we do at that point is we place them on, a, on the wait list. While they're on that wait list, they don't receive a visa because we, we can't give out any visas because we're out. Um, however, we do place them in deferred action. And deferred action isn't a visa. It's not an immigration status. Basically, what deferred action is, it's, uh, it's an administrative tool that we have that basically says, we've got an alien victim here. The alien victim applied for this U visa. USCIS says that they're eligible for it, but we don't have any visas to give out. So what we do as the, as the government, we say, OK, we know where you're at. We know who you are. You applied for this visa you now go to the back of the line, basically, for deportation. Um, so if you, um, you know, even though that you technically don't have a status here, you came forward, you are eligible for a visa, but we're going to place you in this deferred action program until a visa becomes available for you. Um, so again, it's not a status, but it does protect them from removal up to a point. And then while they're in this deferred action process, uh, they also are eligible to apply for work authorization. So even though they don't have a visa, while they're on this deferred action process um, with the waitlist approval process, they are, allowed, um, they are allowed to apply for work authorization. And if they're granted that, um, uh, they will be able to work, uh, work legally and uh, obviously pay taxes legally here in the States. Well, great. Well, thank you, Scott. Let's um, ask another question um, of our audience, and I'm going to make this a A, B, C, or D. Um, who, for those of you who have been working on um, doing T visa endorsements, who have been signing them? Have they been signed by law enforcement as A, a B, prosecutors, C, judges, or D, you're not getting T visas um, endorsed? And so what we're going to see here, Scott, it's interesting to see as our and it's live sharing here, is that the most common response is B, prosecutors, um, and or actually now the most common one is D, not getting um, visas. And of those who are getting the T visa, T, T visa endorsements, it's going to be mainly 33% um, are going to be from B, which is prosecutors, and 14% from A, which is law enforcement. And so we do not see a zero on judges in this audience. So interesting, Scott. No, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, and that, and that goes to the, it kind of goes to the fact too, like we were talking about earlier with um, T visa petitions, or T visa applications, excuse me, and uh, not ever giving, uh, getting to the level of that 5,000. Um, it just goes to show how difficult human trafficking, not only identifying human trafficking, but actually putting together a solid case and going out and making arrests can be, but then also how difficult the job is for prosecutors to actually bring forward and get a successful human, human trafficking case uh, prosecuted. They're, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly 
a difficult process. The law is very specific, so um, I, this is uh, you know this information kind of goes with the flow and our understanding of human trafficking in the uh, and in the criminal justice and, and judicial process. Um, so then going ahead and moving forward onto the T visa requirements. Uh, so there's four basic requirements for somebody to be eligible for a T visa. Now the victim um, has to be a victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons. And what that means is they have to be a victim of human trafficking and they have to meet the federal definition of either sex trafficking or labor trafficking in order to be eligible for a T visa. So again, they have to be a victim of trafficking and they're going to have to meet one of the federal definitions of sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Now the victim also has to be physically present in the United States on account of the trafficking. So their physical presence here, uh, whether um, you know, they've just been rescued, uh, if, they're, um, uh, if they're cooperating in a prosecution, whatever it is, their physical presence here in the United States is based on that trafficking, um, is based on that trafficking situation. The victim further has to comply with any reasonable requests from law enforcement um, you know, or prosecutors, anything like that, in the, uh, in the investigation or prosecution of the, uh, of the human trafficking crime. Now, there's a couple of exceptions to this. Uh, if we have a victim that's under 18 years of age at the time of the trafficking, or if we have a victim that has, that has suffered so much trauma due to the trafficking that they cannot be expected to reasonably comply with law enforcement uh, in that investigation or prosecution, they may meet that um, they may meet that exception. Now, the exception, the burden of the burden of proof on that will be rest uh, will rest with the victim. Um, so the victim can't just merely say, "I suffered trauma. I shouldn't have to cooperate." There's going to have to be evidence there uh, to show that they suffered uh, trauma rising to a level where they can't reasonably expect uh, to be uh, to cooperate in that investigation or prosecution. And then finally, uh, the victim is going to have to demonstrate extreme hardship. Uh, involving unusual, uh, unusual and severe harm upon removal if we were to remove them from the United States. Now what that basically means is the victim is going to be showing the Department of Homeland Security and USCIS, my agency, that if we were to deport them, if we were to remove them from the United States, that victim would suffer extreme hardship uh, involving unusual and severe harm once we deported them. Now some, um, now this isn't an ex this is not an exhaustive list, um, but some of the evidence that we see to show extreme hardship would be separation from family, uh, medical issues. For instance, we've, got, uh, we've run into victims where they, they're suffering from, uh, whether it be an illness or trauma, whatever it is, um, where they cannot reasonably be expected, or they, they know that they're not going to get uh, good treatment, not good medical treatment back home. Uh, where really the United States is um, is really the only place where they're going to get ad adequate medical um, adequate medical treatment. So that's another uh, source of evidence that we see. And then also economic issues. Uh, so if we've got a trafficking victim that was actually um, you know the only breadwinner or um, you know the only one that can really support their family uh, when a either when they're in the trafficking situation or b now that they're out. Um, you know, all they have to do is uh, they show us that, hey, my, I will suffer and my family will suffer uh, economically if I'm removed from the United States. So again, that's just one of the, uh, one of the other uh, uh, points of evidence that uh, folks will share with us uh, on that. Now jumping forward to the uh, Law Enforcement Supplement B. So this is the form that a uh, law enforcement agency or a judge or a prosecutor can sign for a human trafficking victim who is cooperating in that human trafficking investigation or prosecution. Now the form is optional. So what that means in this case is for T visa applicants, they can still apply for a T visa even if they don't have this form. So the form is not required. However, it do, this form does provide a lot of evidence for that victim. It's considered a primary source of evidence. So it does carry some weight with it. Um, it's a three-page uh, three form, very simple, um, just asking about uh, the trafficking situation and how this, uh, how this victim cooperated or, uh, you know, for a judge, your observations of the victim uh, in the judicial process. Now, if this form is signed off on by law enforcement or a prosecutor or judge, it is signed at the judge's or law enforcement's discretion. So there is no federal law, there is no statute, there is no regulation, there is no requirement that says law enforcement or a judge or a prosecutor must sign these forms. These are always signed at the discretion of the person signing the form. So if you ever have uh, you know, an attorney or anybody like that 
saying, um, you know, hey, you have to sign this form. Federal law says you have to do this. That is simply not the case. These are always signed at the discretion of law enforcement or the judge. Uh, of course, if you wanted to provide any additional doc documentation uh, with your 914 uh, Supplement B that you are going to sign, uh, you can attach anything you want to that. And once that is finished, you just simply hand that back to the victim or to the victim's attorney or advocate or whoever uh, is assisting that victim. You don't have to send anything separate to USCIS. Um, you, all you have to do is give that back to the victim and then they will uh, in turn send that to us with their entire uh, application package. So there's nothing on the side that you have to do. Uh, there's nothing uh, specific or separate that you have to send to USCIS. You simply give that back to the victim or their attorney and then they will send um, all of that information in to us uh, for that. Now uh, going, going ahead and jumping forward to the U visa requirements. So we just did the T's and now we're on to the U. And they have a lot of similarities, but they also have their differences as well. Uh, so the four basic requirements for the U visa is that we have to have a victim of a qualifying crime and the crime had to have occurred in the United States or violated United States law. Uh, the victim also has to possess credible and uh, relevant, reliable information about that crime. Uh, real, real straightforward. They're just going to have to know uh, the details and the facts and the information um, you know, of the criminal activity that took place against them. Um, the third eligibility requirement, and this one causes some confusion uh, not only with uh, victims and attorneys and advocates, but also with law enforcement, um, so we're going to be diving into more detail on this in a bit, is that the, uh, the victim either has been, is being, or is likely to be helpful in an investigation or prosecution of that crime. Uh, and again, we'll dive into more details uh, on that in a bit, but that is specific language that Congress put in. Uh, we obviously mirror that in regulation, so it's, um, uh, it has a, lot of, uh, has a lot of background to it, has a lot of information for it, so we'll definitely get that to you in a bit. And then finally, the victim has to have suffered substantial physical or mental abuse based on that crime. And one thing that I really want to, um, that I really want to point out for that requirement is that the substantial physical or mental abuse requirement is not something that we're asking law enforcement or prosecutors or judges to make the determination of whether or not they think that person suffered substantial physical or mental abuse. Since it is a core eligibility requirement and since our officers have to look at this and have to make a determination on whether or not this victim suffered substantial physical or mental abuse, this is something that DHS and USCIS have to make that determination on. So we do not ask law enforcement, we don't ask uh, prosecutors or judges to sit there and try to make a determination on whether or not they believe that there was substantial abuse here. We have to follow federal guidelines uh, when it comes to that. Uh, the victim will be supplying plenty of evidence um, to, to bolster their argument that they have suffered uh, substantial abuse. And then further, uh, on the form, which we'll get into in a second, but on the, on the law enforcement certification form, there's actually, uh, there's actually a section there where you can write in um, what you've seen in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, abuse, whether or not you did notice abuse or uh, whether or not you have evidence of it, that kind of thing. Uh, and like I said, we'll get into that in a bit, but I did want to point out that that is specifically for USCIS to make the, determ uh, the determination on for that eligibility requirement. Okay, Judge, uh, Judge Livingston, can you talk a little bit about U, U visa regulation definitions? Sure. Uh, you know, lawyers and those of us in the legal community are often trying to figure out what we mean by words, uh, and so this is another example of that. When the regulations speak in terms of investigation or prosecution, uh, basically that means detection, investigation, prosecution, conviction, sentencing. It seems sort of obvious, but we really just wanted to make the point that it's not just one of those things. It can include a variety of activities, uh, and we want, we want practitioners to be thinking broadly in terms of uh, how a, uh, an immigrant victim, for example, might uh, be able to make, take advantage of the U visa process. And so think broadly when you're working with victims and think in terms of both detection, investigation, and prosecution, uh, conviction, sentencing, anything that might be sort of related to that we think is going to be uh, qualifying under this regulation. Crime, uh, not necessarily, uh, I, I think you should again think broadly in terms of what is criminal activity? What, are, what have they done? We're going to talk in a minute and show you a list of all of the qualifying crimes. There's just a, a simple list and if what happened in this particular circumstance is on that list, it's going to qualify. 
but think in terms of activity that might be considered lawbreaking. Think in terms of activity that might just generally and obviously be considered criminal activity, and that's probably going to work. Uh, and we, we, the point of this really is to try to improve stability for victims and uh, get early detection underway so that we can put an end to uh, an escalating violent situation or an escalating criminal activity of some kind. So think broadly when you're thinking about uh, what these terms mean. Well, thank you. Um, back to you, Scott. Thank you. Uh, so jumping forward, uh, or jumping ahead again to the U visa qualifying criminal activity, um, I'm going to put up the slide showing the criminal activity, uh, the criminal activities that Congress specifically laid out here in a second. But there's a couple of things I wanted to state first. Uh, now granted, uh, these are general crime categories. Uh, so for instance, you're going to see domestic violence as one of the crime uh, categories um, uh, that's listed. So there's no federal definition of domestic violence that uh, a victim has to meet in order to be eligible. Again, as general crime categories, what we're looking at is uh, the crime that was committed against the victim in their local, um, in their local jurisdiction. We're looking at the definition um, of the crime um, you know, that that state or that city has for, for that crime. And then if that, uh, if that definition that criminal offense, you know, looks uh, looks very similar to the general crime category, domestic violence, or whatever other crime we have. That person can be eligible for a U visa. Now, this also includes substantially similar crimes as well. Uh, now, for instance, I will flip over here just to show you the crimes here. Now, one example is uh, sexual exploitation and video voyeurism. Uh, so you'll see on our list of qualifying criminal activities that sexual exploitation is a qualifying crime. So if we have a victim of sexual exploitation, they may be eligible for a U visa. Now, however, uh, what if they were a victim of video voyeurism? And if the local statute or however, um, uh, however the police or prosecutors move forward in charging and prosecuting that crime, if they move forward and just said, well, you know, we, we don't have sexual exploitation, this was actually video voyeurism and we're, we're charging and prosecuting video voyeurism. That certainly doesn't mean that that, um, that that victim is out of luck and is not eligible for a U visa. They can certainly argue that video voyeurism is a form or is a type of sexual exploitation. Now, the burden will be on them to show to USCIS that the crime that they suffered from is substantially similar to one of our qualifying criminal activities. Uh, but if they make that argument and if the crime is substantially similar, they certainly may uh, be eligible. And my agency, USCIS, will be the ones making the determination on whether or not that crime uh, actually uh, meets uh, or actually is substantially similar to one of the qualifying crimes. Now, again, looking at the chart here, this this chart was not created by um, was not created by the Department of Homeland Security. This was actually in in statute. So Congress put these uh, put these crimes in, and this is what Congress said uh, will act as qualifying criminal activity. Uh, you'll see domestic violence is up there. Um, I don't have specific numbers for you, but I can certainly tell you that domestic violence is, um, is the most prevalent crime that we see uh, with people applying for U visas. Uh, and uh, also with domestic violence, we see a lot of sexual assault cases uh, that can certainly be listed as domestic violence in certain situations, but obviously sexual assaults that, uh, that take place uh, outside of the realm of domestic violence, we see plenty of those as well. Uh, you'll also see that human trafficking is on here. Um, so why would we have human trafficking in the U visa world and the T visa world? Uh, well, like we said before, with the T visas, you have to be a victim of trafficking in order to be eligible for that, and you have to meet the federal definition, whether that be sex trafficking or labor trafficking. However, in the U visa world, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have that, uh, uh, we don't have that requirement. Uh, in the U visa world. Um, you can be a victim of human trafficking, meeting your state definition. Uh, right now, all 50 states have their own uh, definition of human trafficking. So if someone, for whatever reason, doesn't meet a federal definition, but if they meet a state definition, they can, uh, uh, they can apply as a victim of human trafficking um, uh, under the U visa as well. Um, so, and again, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the crimes that you see on here are obviously very serious in nature, and a lot of them are related to either labor trafficking or sex trafficking as well. So I again, that's our, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Leslie. Quick question. Um, one other difference 
um, between U visa trafficking and T visa trafficking is you could have a trafficking victim that might not be able to prove extreme hardship. And so they wouldn't have to for the U, but they would have to for a T. That's another distinction between the two. Absolutely, absolutely. And if, um, and again, for whatever reason, if they, if they could not meet those human trafficking elements, uh, you know, we have involuntary servitude. Uh, you know, we've got the sexual uh, sexual assault. We have felonious assault. We have rape. Um, all sorts of different crimes there that may uh, that may certainly be wrapped up in a human trafficking scenario. Uh, but if for whatever reason human trafficking can't be proven, we certainly have these other cases as a backdrop uh, where someone can uh, still be eligible for a U visa if they're a victim of one of our qualifying crimes that's there. So then moving on to helpfulness and um, uh, just diving into a little bit more uh, detail on this. So the alien has been, is being, or is likely to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of the criminal activity. So what we have here is, you know, it's an investigation or a prosecution. Um, and also the verb tense is here. So the has been, is being, or is likely to be. Now, there is nothing in federal law, nothing in statute, nothing in regulation, and Congress certainly didn't establish any, um, any statute of limitations on when a crime occurred and when somebody can actually be eligible. So uh, technically, somebody can be a victim of a crime two, three, four, five, ten years ago and still be eligible for a U visa. Now, they're still going to have to meet all the eligibility requirements. They're still going to have to be uh, helpful to law enforcement. They still have to be a victim of a qualifying crime. They're going to have to show substantial physical or mental abuse. Um, however, um, they are technically still eligible. There's nothing that bars them from applying for a U visa just because the crime occurred um, you know, outside of you know, within the last six months. Uh, so again, there's nothing barring them from that. Uh, now, however, a couple uh, other big things I wanted to note on helpfulness. Now, if someone applies for a U visa, the moment that they send their application in and then we, we get it. So we receipt it. We send out a receipt notice to the alien victim saying, hey, we've got your, we've got your application here and now we're looking at it. From that moment, so from the time we receive it and that petition is pending and we're reviewing it, and hypothetically, if it is approved, the entire time they're in U visa um, status as well, so that four years, that entire time, so while it's pending and while they're in that, U, uh, in that U visa status, they have an ongoing duty to cooperate with law enforcement, prosecutors, or judges in the investigation or prosecution. Uh, that, that is a requirement uh, that, is, uh, that is in there by regulation. They have to do it. Now, what that means is if someone applies and they later uh, refuse to cooperate or they refuse to help um, whoever signed off on the certification, whether that be a police department, whether that be a prosecutor or a judge, those certifying agencies or those officials that signed off on the law enforcement certification can notify USCIS and say, hey, this person isn't helping me out anymore. I wish to withdraw that. And we're going to get into more details on that. Um, but this is a huge, huge, huge requirement for uh, U visa petitioners um, to, to continue their cooperation and helpfulness. Uh, with the with the official that signed the uh, the certification, so I definitely wanted uh, to bring that up to you uh, to you all as well. And then finally, uh, we do have an exception um, for those that are under 16 or that are incompetent or incapacitated. Um, so if we've got a victim that's under 16 years old, or if they're incompetent or incapacitated, they do not have to show this helpfulness requirement. Somebody can step forward and essentially stand in their uh, stand in their shoes and provide the helpfulness for them in order to continue to make that victim eligible for, um, for a U visa. Uh, so again, for those under 16 or if they are incompetent or incapacitated, others can step forward and help them, uh, help them through the process and that person can still be eligible for a U visa. Well, great. Well, thank you, Scott. Let's um, ask our audience, what profession would be most likely to certify future helpfulness? Do you see this as police, A? B, prosecutor, C, police and prosecutor, or D, judges. And so far, I don't, ah, now people are starting to vote. And what we are seeing is, um, and I believe, Scott, we are getting this live response, is that overwhelmingly people are saying C, police and prosecutors, is what they are seeing. And then there's a little bit that are also um, B, which is prosecutor, and D, judges. So overwhelmingly, people are seeing police and prosecutors being the profession most likely to certify future helpfulness. 
and mm-hmm. and I'll pick it up from there. This is Leslie. Um, that that is correct. That that in fact, generally speaking, when judges sign certifications, they're going to be in large part signing them on things based on helpfulness they've already observed, as opposed to law enforcement and prosecutors because law enforcement prosecutors are likely to encounter the case earlier on in the process, they might be more likely to be the ones asked to sign on future helpfulness. And so just to give you a summary, the next few slides um, talk about some of the key ways that helpfulness can occur. It can occur by a victim being a cooperating witness. It might be at the grand jury stage. It might be in identifying the perpetrator. might be participating and communicating with um, uh, prosecutors about their, you know, if there's bond, what kind of stay away order should be in place, motions, uh, victim impact statements. There's various different ways that in a criminal context the, um, the, the victim may provide helpfulness that the court may observe. Judge Livingston? I think you can see the same type of examples on the slide we have up next uh, regarding what you might see in a civil courtroom or in a family courtroom. Obviously in the context of a civil protection order, uh, providing evidence of a domestic violence or child abuse in a custody case, which might be in family court, providing information about elder abuse or child abuse to one of the child protective services or adult protective services agencies, providing evidence um, in, in any kind of you know, sort of civil context or family context and obviously making a police report. Those are all examples of how someone might be deemed to be helpful. Back to me, I think. Um, yep. David, can you change the slide? There we go. And so, and then in the, the what prosecutors and police see, there's a, judges may observe this as well, like a victim in a protection order case may testify that she called 911 or that she spoke to the police when they came on the scene that you, you might have evidence in a custody case with a copy of a police report. Um, there might be um, testimony or evidence that, that of, about the various different kinds of roles that um, in a case before court uh, that the victim played vis-a-vis working with police or prosecutors in the case. So, um, and that what's really important is, is that helpfulness can be met as, as Scott was talking earlier, um, there's, the victim actually, first of all, there's no statute of limitations, and second of all, the victim doesn't have control necessarily over the criminal court process. And so you can, it's, it can be sufficient helpfulness for a victim to come forward, report a crime, and if there's no further investigation to cooperate with, that could be sufficient. It could be a past crime. The perpetrator could have absconded. Um, the perpetrator could be prosecuted for a different crime. We see this a lot where in gang or drug prosecutions, um, the victim, a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault from one of the gang members or drug traffickers um, might actually be a witness in that case, but might would also report the domestic violence or sexual assault and get this certification in the in the criminal case, in the domestic violence or sexual assault case, even though the case being prosecuted is drugs or um, uh, uh, gang violence, for example. Um, and so there's a variety of different things that can happen that don't preclude um, helpfulness. Scott? Okay. Scott, and I just want to note, Scott, that we are, our time is going quickly, so if we can go quickly through these slides, we want to be able to get to the forms that we'll be reviewing later on. Absolutely. Um, so very quickly, uh, victims, what are we looking at? Um, you know, just for all, uh, you know, just being very, uh, being very general about it, um, it's the person that had the crime uh, committed against them. So, you know, nine times out of ten, that's what we're going to be seeing. Uh, however, if we have a victim of murder or manslaughter, certain family members can step forward, cooperate with law enforcement, and they may be able uh, to be eligible for, uh, you, uh, for a U visa as an indirect victim. Um, now the most prevalent uh, indirect victim uh, situation that we see is actually, um, uh, is actually where we have someone who, we, we've got a child who is an American citizen. So we've got this child, they've got a crime committed against them, and their parents find out about it, and the parents come forward and, uh, the parents come forward and they report the crime to law enforcement. Now, the child, as an American citizen, isn't eligible for any immigration benefit because there's nothing that we can confer upon an American citizen. 
they're already a citizen. We can't give them a visa or anything like that. There's just nothing that we can give them. However, um, in this situation, the parents can step forward and they can speak for that child victim. And if the parents meet all the different eligibility requirements for a U visa, that parent may be able to apply for a U visa as an indirect principal victim. So even though the parent didn't have the crime committed against them, they may be able to step forward, speak for their child, and, uh, and as long as they meet all the eligibility requirements, and as long as they're helpful with law enforcement, they may be able uh, to get a U visa down the road. Um, now, the Law Enforcement Supplement B certification. Now, this is, uh, this is the law enforcement form. So this is the form that a judge or a prosecutor or the police department would sign for someone who wants to, uh, for someone who wants to apply for a U visa. Now, as we talked about with the T visa law enforcement form before, we said it was optional where someone could apply for a T visa without this form. With the U visa, it's actually a requirement. So, someone, so if we've got a victim and somebody wants to apply for a U visa, they're going, to have to, uh, they're going to have to have this form signed off by law enforcement in order to be eligible for a U visa. Now, the 918B, this form does not grant any benefit. It doesn't guarantee that someone's going to be granted a U visa if somebody applies. This form is only telling us uh, a few different things, and it provides USCIS with basic information about the criminal activity that, uh, that took place against that victim. Once again, this is signed completely at the discretion of law enforcement or a prosecutor or a judge. Uh, so again, if someone came forward and said, you have to sign this, federal law uh, mandates that you sign it, that is certainly not the case. This is something, uh, again, that if you are going to sign this 918B, this is signed at your discretion. And of course, there's going to have to be additional evidence that the uh, victim provides to USCIS to show us that, that, uh, that they are indeed eligible for a U visa. Um, and again, that's the victimization, the substantial physical and mental abuse, the qualifying criminal activity, all, all of those uh, previous eligibility requirements. So again, um, while this form is a requirement, uh, it does not grant any benefit if you do sign off on it. And again, you are, not, uh, uh, you are not mandated to sign. These are always signed at your discretion. If you do sign, um, you again will just hand that back to the victim and the victim will send everything into us on that. Uh, we want this form uh, completed entirely by law enforcement or by the prosecution of the judge. Uh, this, is the time, uh, this is the time where we certainly want uh, law enforcement or the judge to speak to USCIS to let them, uh, to have them tell us what their interaction was and everything that they uh, have witnessed uh, with the victim in this investigation or prosecution. And we at USCIS, we don't have any type of registration process or anything that the certifying official or the police department or judge or prosecutor has to follow through on to sign off on these. Um, you know, we don't keep a database or anything like that. Um, you can certainly put on official letterhead, uh, whether it be from you know, your circuit or your department or, um, or your office that says, you know, you know, this is my agency, this is who I am, and I do have the authority to sign off on these. Now we keep those uh, just for a record for ourselves, but again, there's no official registration process, there's nothing special that you have to do in order to sign off on one of these, uh, to sign off on one of the 918B petitions. Okay, great. So let's ask, who is authorized by the U visa statute and regulations to sign certifications for the U visa? Who is authorized? So go ahead and click into the box on the left. A, judge. B, prosecutor. C, police, law enforcement. D, other. And lastly, what I am seeing is about half of our audience is, oh no, it is changing. It's now getting pretty equal between the four. So lastly, I'm noticing pretty equal between the four. Now a little bit more with C, police, law enforcement. Leslie? I mean, all of them, all of the above, actually should have been one of the answers. Um, as you guys are authorized to sign, it can be, um, and that people will do it in different ways. So there are entities that, and it could be any entity that it detects, investigates, prosecutes, convicts, or sentences. So generally detection, agencies that do it based on detection are usually judges in places like the EEOC, the Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor. Um, groups like that. People 
um, uh, certifiers who will generally do it based on investigation or prosecution will be more likely to be prosecutors. I'm getting a voice in the background. I'm going to go mute the lines, Leslie, and just one second. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Hi, Leslie. Well, I'm back. getting back here. Great. Thank you. So other, but, but there's a range of agencies that can certify. Um, I guess the next question is, do, can you guys, could you please fill in the box? Do you know, do people have ideas about why they made judges U visa certifiers in addition to police prosecutors and others? Can you type into the text box why you think they made judges certifiers? So why do you believe did Congress um, include judges um, is, as U visa certifiers? Um, so let's see what we are, if anyone, let's see if we can get a response from someone. I just, uh, ah, we've got a few people here. Um, so why did Congress include judges in the U visa statute? So Leslie, I think it's a really important question that they were thoughtful. Um, Deborah, Deborah says um, include a neutral view. Mm -hmm. That's certainly one of the reasons. Any other ideas? And uh, we see because um, judges are more willing to sign their than law enforcement or prosecutors, which someone said Martha says is the case in her area. Um, neutral party, um, able to certify helpfulness. They can because it can facilitate judges in handling criminal cases against the defendant because they may be hearing cases at a later time. There's a participation in the court process is crucial. Um, so I'm seeing many people, um, they do research on cases prior to making a court decision, and that they are the main part um, that they involve the whole case. So there's several of the reasons that we see, Leslie, that people are responding. Generally, a lot of all of that is true. I mean, part of it has to do with the fact that um, Judges are a neutral broker. They are um, all of the groups, what they have in common that are certifiers are people who kind of by definition as part of their day jobs are deciding day in and day out things like probable cause, credibility, who's telling the truth, things like that, and that Congress wanted um, to include judges because they actually understood that there would be jurisdictions where police might not certify, prosecutors might not certify, but a victim would avail themselves of the justice system anyway and wanted to be sure that they could obtain uh, certification if they did so. And that's why judges, all of the reasons above and, and, and um, plus, plus that is generally why judges uh, were chosen as certifiers. Because they wanted to be sure that victims, as a way of making sure that victims can get stuck. And, um, and that essentially also there are times in which the, the court to a certain extent, particularly for limited English proficient victims, is, can be the first responder with a qualified interpreter. And so there was, we, this, this slide reports some of the research done among, um, about immigrant victims and the police within the last, in 2013, which found kind of high levels of cases in which victims didn't have interpreter, qualified interpreters to speak with the police and it resulted in police reports not being taken and the perpetrators interpreting and things like that. So courts may be the first time that the victim actually has an opportunity to explain her story. Back to you, Scott. And Scott, I just want to encourage you to move quickly because we still have a lot of slides and want to be able to go through the forms a little bit later. Um, star yes. six, Scott? Yep. Okay. Okay, so uh, just very quickly, uh, there's a lot of language on this slide, but it's actually really, really simple. Um, so for the, the law enforcement supplement B, uh, for both the T and the U, who are we looking at? Who can actually put pen to paper and sign these? While that's a long, long definition, basically all that, all that says is any federal, uh, federal, state, or local law enforcement agency or prosecutor or judge who has the authority um, uh, in their day-to-day -day operations uh, for the detection, investigation, prosecution, conviction, or sentencing of the qualifying criminal activity, those agencies are allowed to sign off on the certification. So obviously that would include judges and prosecutors and law enforcement. Um, there are civil um, authorities that may sign off as well, just FYI. Uh, certain civil authorities that are spe uh, specifically given by regulation are child and adult or family protective services and also the Department of Labor and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission 
and that includes state level as well. So that's federal and state level with those. And then again, just very briefly, uh, we talked about it before, uh, is signing the 918 or 914D law enforcement forms mandatory. And again, that is not, uh, it's completely at your discretion. Uh, no federal law says that you, do, that you have to sign off on those. So again, it's at your discretion, whatever policies that your offices uh, come up with in order to sign, uh, that, will be, uh, that will be all dictated by you and is under your authority. So uh, who is the actual person that can sign off? Um, for law enforcement and prosecutors, we're looking at the head of the certifying agency or anyone in a supervisory role that's been given, uh, that, who's been given that authority. So we do have to have the head of the agency or we have to have somebody who was given um, who, who has been given that who has been given that role. Now, this also includes obviously federal, state, and local judges, and these can be uh, civil, criminal, or administrative courts as well. And then moving forward, just on some quick notes here, um, as Leslie mentioned before, uh, convictions, prosecutions, and arrests are not necessary in order for someone to be eligible for a, uh, for a U visa. Uh, we've seen or, or a T for that matter. Uh, we've seen plenty of instances where uh, someone co is cooperating with law enforcement, local PD needed to go out and make an arrest. They do go out and make that arrest only to find out that uh, ICE beat them to it. ICE picked, up that, uh, ICE picked up that perpetrator and ICE supported them. Well, we're not going to penalize uh, the victim of domestic violence or another local crime just because uh, ICE uh, beat them to it and ICE actually was able to deport that individual. So that person still may be eligible for a U visa, and again, that's just one example of that. Uh, if we have a defendant that's acquitted or uh, convicted or pleads down to a different crime, uh, as long as the, the criminal activity is there um, and, the, and there's evidence that a uh, qualifying crime occurred, that U visa uh, or that victim may still be eligible for a U visa. Now, um, everyone who applies for a T or a U visa uh, will, get, will go through a thorough background check. Uh, so once somebody applies for a T or a U, um, we will send them a notice right away and we will give them a fingerprint appointment. Uh, so they will go to a federal DHS facility and they will have their fingerprints taken. Uh, we, send, uh, we send those fingerprints off to the FBI. Uh, the FBI does a full background check on those prints. Uh, they do a full name and date of birth check. Uh, we do our own name and date of birth checks as well. We look at all immigration records. So we certainly do a thorough scrub of that individual before uh, we're going to be granting any visa. And of course, um, any agency or any judge um, can notify um, ICE or USCIS of any known or suspected criminal activity uh, that that person has been engaged in, like if they were a perpetrator or they actually had a criminal record. Uh, if, you, if there's any type of information that you want us to know, uh, you can certainly let us know that as well. Uh, now, going speaking to the certification again, what is the certification actually telling USCIS? So what is that certification saying? We talked about before how the certification does not grant any benefits. So just for the fact that a certification is signed, that certainly doesn't uh, automatically grant somebody a visa. So the certification is telling us three basic things. That one, that the person signing that form has seen evidence of the qualifying criminal activity, that the victim did have knowledge of the criminal activity, which goes to the basic eligibility requirements that that victim does have specific knowledge of the criminal activity that took place against them. And then finally, that that victim was, is, or is likely to be helpful to law enforcement uh, and is likely to be helpful uh, if more um, information needed or more cooperation is needed uh, in the future. So those are the three basic things that the form is telling us. Uh, it's, not, it's not speaking to any type of future conduct for the victim. Uh, it's not, you are not serving as a character for the victim, saying this person is a pillar of the community or they will be a pillar, anything like that. You're just telling us, that certification is just telling us those three basic things that we talked about previously. And again, you're not, if uh, law enforcement signs off on this form, they're not sponsoring, they're not endorsing, um, they're not saying that this person deserves a visa. They're just saying that this person was helpful that they had knowledge, and that they were a victim of a crime. That's all that that form is telling us. The form doesn't guarantee any type of visa issuance. Again, only my agency can do that, so we're on the hook for all that. We are the ones that will make that determination. And we will only make that determination once we see all evidence that comes in. Uh, the, the law enforcement certification forms are just one piece of evidence. So it's one spoke in the wheel for us to make that determination. And uh, moving into the future, if you do sign a certification, 
there is nothing that um, makes you liable for any future conduct or any type of conduct down the road uh, or any actions committed by, um, by that alien victim. So you're not speaking for that person. You're not saying that, yes, uh, you know, I'm there. Uh, you know, I'm going to be keeping an eye on them, uh, that uh, they're going to have to check in with me regularly or anything like that. There's no type of requirement like that. Again, the certifying official is only telling us those three small things that we talked about previously. Okay, Leslie. And that I guess the one point I want to add and that judges have the discretion to sign, um, as Judge Livingston will be talking about a little later, um, most judges will be signing after they've issued a ruling. They have the discretion, however, to sign uh, at an earlier point in the proceedings as well. All right. Well, let me uh, let me just jump in here by adding that you know, in addition to if you decide you're going to exercise your discretion as a judge, I would recommend in terms of the order that you enter in a proceeding that the order be specific. So when it comes to providing information about what criminal activity occurred, if, for example, it's in the context of a civil protection order, you might say that family violence has occurred, which is a typical finding in many, and if not all states, that have a requirement for the issuance of a protective order. You're going to make a finding that family violence has occurred in some states it has occurred or likely to occur in the future and so forth. Uh, that's the easiest one. If you're going to make that finding for the protective order, it's pretty easy to just add that information to a U visa certification form. That should not be difficult. Uh, identifying the victim is pretty easy as well. Obviously, the person in the protective order, I'm just using that because it's a very common and typical example of how we see these come to about. Um, so identifying the victim is pretty, pretty easy to do. With regard to helpfulness, um, you know, current past, willingness to be helpful, you're going to be taking evidence from these individuals and so it shouldn't be very difficult at all to assess this element as well. I want to also point out that family members that are implicated in the crime is going to be helpful information. So if the perpetrator in the protective order context is a spouse, for example, or an intimate partner, including that information in your findings is a really helpful uh, piece of information. That's the kind of information that you're going to add to the certification form. In terms of criminal activity and helpfulness, um, I think the timing is, is key in some respects. Um, before a ruling, you know, as I was sort of thinking about this in preparation for the webinar, I was thinking about sort of the phases that we might encounter people asking for judges to sign certification forms. Um, sometimes that's going to be before a ruling. Um, so you're going to be evaluating credibility. Is the information and the evidence you've received in the context of your case trustworthy and believable? Uh, even if you don't get everything, even if it's a preliminary hearing, even if it's just a temporary restraining order where there's not a ton of evidence deduced as there might be in a, in a future proceeding. But some credible evidence um, is enough. Probable cause. Do you, if you were going to be making a probable cause determination in some other context to issue an arrest warrant, for example, the same kind of information that you use to, to issue an arrest warrant is the same kind of evaluation you're going to make to determine if you have probable cause to believe that criminal activity uh, occurred and that the victim was helpful or uh, would likely to be helpful in the future and so forth. More than just bare suspicion, uh, but, but really probable cause and uh, judges are pretty uh, accustomed to making those kinds of determinations. Um, I mentioned the, the context of the temporary restraining order. Uh, very simple examples, we think, of how you might encounter these as someone being requested to sign a certification form. Um, after the ruling, um, you're going to be entering findings, which we talked about. You're going to use the basic standards of proof, right? Preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence, or uh, the all important in a criminal context beyond a reasonable doubt. All right. Can I just interrupt for a second, David? Can you move? Sure. Okay. We got the slides. Never mind. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I think actually um, my only sort of footnote here is just that you know after the ruling, these are the exact kinds of. of of things that judges do every day, and these are the standards by which we do them. And so this is really a, a should be a, a kind of a comfortable zone for judges to be in because these are kind of decisions we make all the time. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm just going to take one. Uh, I just want to do a poll. If you could find the hand raising, how I'm just going to ask two questions. How of those of you who've either signed or received a certification from a judge, how many of you have done it in the protection order context? Can you raise your hands? 
at least one. Well, a few more coming in, Leslie. Okay. Great. So a couple of you have. Uh, David, can you take your hands down? How many of you have done it in a criminal context, in a criminal case? Not seeing anybody. Oh, no, there's a few. Okay, a few more. A few, a few more. Okay. Um, great. Uh, what about a custody case? Anybody done one, anybody on the uh, signed one or received one in a custody case where there was a uh, or a child abuse case? Uh, we got at least one of those. Okay. Um, so what we're gonna so essentially they can these certifications can happen in all of these different kinds of cases, and they can happen at various different times in the case. And Laura will be talking about that in a few minutes. So I'm going to turn it back over to Scott. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and as we talked about it in the beginning, uh, if somebody is granted a Tier U visa, they, that visa is a non-immigrant visa, meaning it does have a defined life, it's got a shelf life, and it's been for four years. Uh, however, Congress did put in the ability uh, to uh, to have a T or a U visa holder have the ability to uh, apply for their green card or apply for their lawful permanent residency. Uh, what that means for you as a cert as someone who has signed a certification, uh, what that means is somebody may come to you three years down the road uh, because the uh, the regulations require uh, three years of uh, somebody having that visa before they apply. They may come to you and ask you um, for a follow-up letter uh, basically saying that this person has not refused to cooperate at all um, in the investigation or prosecution. Now, because that's a, that's a piece of evidence that they need in order to be eligible for their green card. Uh, so there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Um, it's, it's real, real simple. You can either, if you held on to a copy of the original uh, 914 or 918 B that you signed, uh, you can make a photocopy of that with a new signature and a new date and just putting a note on there saying that this person has not refused to cooperate. Uh, you can fill out a new 914 or a 918 B again uh, simply stating that this person has not refused to cooperate at all um, uh, in, in the investigation or prosecution and that will suffice as well. Or you can just uh, do something very simple on, a, on your official letterhead. It doesn't have to be paragraph or two. Uh, again, simply stating, simply stating that this person has not refused to cooperate. All, any of those three options will work uh, in this instance. So if somebody does come to you down the road and asks for this, this is why they're asking for it. It will be for their, uh, for their uh, eligibility for a green card. And as we talked about before, they, uh, with this letter, they are showing that they fulfilled their ongoing duty to cooperate with reasonable requests from law enforcement. Uh, so the victim is basically just saying, hey, um, they either asked me to cooperate and I did, or they never asked me, so you know, therefore you know, it's not, it, I didn't refuse to cooperate. I was always here. I was always available. Um, so that's what those letters are telling us. Now, if a victim does refuse uh, to comply with any reasonable requests uh, for, for continued cooperation, uh, the law enforcement agency or the prosecutor or judge may revoke their certification. Uh, so what that means is that judge or that prosecutor uh, is basically withdrawing or they're disavowing their certification. So what they will do is they will notify our Vermont Service Center. The USCIS Vermont Service Center is where all the T and U applications are adjudicated. Uh, and we will have that contact up for, uh, information up for you at the end. So all you'll do is email the Vermont Service Center saying, hey, I signed the certification for this individual and I want to pull it. Um, you know, for whatever reason, you can always um, you can always pull a certification that you previously uh, previously signed, and that again is at your discretion. Um, that, you know nobody can tell you to pull uh, to, to pull out uh, of the certification or anything like that. That will always be your call. Um, and once if you do do that, and that withdrawal is done, and that person no longer has a certification, um, that may lead to that person's uh, visa status being revoked. Um, so again, this, uh, this ongoing duty to uh, cooperate is very important. We take it very seriously. Uh, so what happens if that, uh, if, that's, if that certification is pulled, we will then send notice to the victim that they no longer have a certification. Now the victim will have an opportunity to send evidence back into USCIS. They do have an opportunity to respond. 
saying why my visa shouldn't be revoked. No matter what, whether or not we revoke that visa will always be up to, again, USCIS. So uh, my agency will have, um, will have the final say and has the responsibility of looking over all that evidence to determine whether or not that person has uh, refused to cooperate and uh, whether or not we will, um, uh, we will revoke that visa. And we, we've certainly done it in the past. It's not common, but we certainly have done that. And so what's important to understand is that there's enough number of checks and balances in the system. And in addition to the ability to decide whether or not to revoke, et cetera, it's important to understand that, that, that when somebody comes after three years and files for lawful permanent residency as a U visa holder, they have to prove either cooperation, which is where the second certification Scott was talking about comes from, or they can prove, and this is why it's not an automatic revocation and what the USCIS is deciding when they're deciding if somebody revokes, is they can also prove that they didn't unreasonably refuse to cooperate. And Congress created that option because they understood that for some crime victims that um, the threats from the perpetrator, uh, threats to family members, sometimes he's holding them hostage and they couldn't show up to, because he's got them locked up someplace and they couldn't show up to be a witness, that they have an opportunity to show that their failure to cooperate was not unreasonable under the circumstances of the case, and as part of either the decision not to revoke and or the decision to approve lawful permanent residency could go forward if the victim shows either cooperation or not unreasonably refusing to cooperate. However, even if they show that, once they make that meet those, one of those elements, they have to also show in order to get lawful permanent residency through the U visa program, either humanitarian needs, family interest, or public, uh, uh, family unity, or public interest. Um, humanitarian need uh, would be where if the perpetrator served time in jail and is then deported to their home country that he shares with the victim and he could retaliate if she were deported, that's an example of humanitarian need. Family unity would be an instance in which she has many family members in the United States, some may be citizens, some may be lawful permanent residents, that can be family unity. And public interest is, the way I like to think about it is, is it's somebody where given what they went through in coming forward and the courage they found to come forward and participate in the justice system, maybe they were the star witness in a serial rape prosecution, um, DHS has the discretion based on public interest to grant their lawful permanent residence. Scott? And uh, here, this slide here just has our uh, DHS contact information. So uh, what we were just talking about previously with um, uh, if you wanted to contact the Vermont Service Center, if you want to withdraw or disavow a certification, uh, or if you had case-specific questions on something that you had signed, you can certainly get a hold of them at that uh, long email address at the top left there. Um, our officers will respond and they will certainly get back to you uh, within 72 hours. Um, I would recommend doing the email address. They seem to get uh, back quicker on that. Uh, the phone line is not, um, is not like a live line. It actually goes straight to a voicemail that gets checked later. So if anything, I would certainly, um, I would certainly email. That will be the quickest route. Uh, you can always CC, uh, CC me on those emails as well if you wanted me to have visibility on that. My contact information is on the top right. Um, so my email is there at that scott.p.whalen address. And then my phone number is there, uh, there as well. And if you needed to contact me for any policy questions or just anything that you wanted to talk about uh, in terms of issues or concerns with uh, either the T or the U program, you can get a hold of me uh, as well. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd be happy to go over anything with you. Um, and of course, um, just like with uh, Vermont, uh, the best way to get a hold of me would, uh, would most likely be email. Um, T visa and VAWA, my colleagues are up there as well. Uh, if you wanted to CC them or uh, put them on there, um, those are my colleagues on my team uh, at headquarters as well. And then of course the DHS Blue Campaign, um, that is the DHS wide effort on combating human trafficking. All our information um, for the department in general, so USCIS and ICE and FEMA and Coast Guard and Secret Service and everybody who's under DHS, um, is underneath that blue campaign umbrella, and there's a ton of information on there on just what uh, DHS is doing on combating human trafficking, and there's all sorts of um, not only information, but uh, free materials to take and print out or to order, you know, do whatever you want to do with those uh, in terms of like posters, tear cards, shoe cards, uh, those kind of things. So all sorts of stuff to look at uh, there uh, as well. So uh, that's all our DHS contact information there. 
Okay, yeah, we, and we, so. We, we, um, so. We then um, just to know we've got ten minutes left, um, Leslie. So we probably want to go through this next section quickly. Um, it takes approximately seven to ten months for DHS to adjudicate the U visas at this point. And as Scott mentioned earlier, about most of them are many of them are domestic violence. The two biggest categories, or the three biggest categories, are domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Um, Scott, do you want to just take a, give them a brief, quick overview? What we have left is we're going to review the certification forms and how to fill them out, and then save the last five minutes or six or five or six minutes for Laura to talk about some judicial ethics issues. Uh, sure, no problem. Um, so, like we were saying before, the the forms are really, really uh, they, they're pretty straightforward and very simple. Uh, both the T endorsements and the uh, the, the U certifications they're three pages long. Um, so looking at the first page of the T visa here, uh, we've got the victim information, which is what you would put up top. Uh, this Part B, uh, the agency information, that's where your, uh, uh, you would put your agency's information there, whether uh, you know, you're a judge, you'd put that you're a judge, or if you're a prosecutor, you, know, you would put you know, Cook County State's Attorney's Office or whatever it is. Uh, then you would go forward from there, and the same would go for uh, police departments as well. Um, and then certifying agency categories, you've got prosecutor, judge, or other in law enforcement. Uh, so all that is down there for you there. Um, second page again, uh, or excuse me, uh, going down this uh, Part C statement of claim, uh, we're just looking at uh, sex trafficking and labor trafficking here. So that's what uh, that bottom part is looking at there. Um, second page again, real, real simple. Um, you know, the part here is please describe the victimization. So your knowledge of that person's victimization, you'll put that there. Uh, has the applicant expressed any fear of retaliation or revenge? If you have any information on that, you can put that there. Um, we're, uh, we're just looking for dates here. Um, statutory citations for human trafficking, obviously, uh, we're going to be, uh, will we'll be placed there. And again, these are just more on the dates on when investigations or prosecutions took place. Um, here, we're just looking for a little bit more information about the applicant. You know, have they complied for, uh, with requests? Have they failed to do that? Um, have they been requested to respond? That kind of thing. Any information that you want to put about cooperation or helpfulness can go in this box here. You can certainly put anything you want about the victim uh, in that box. And then again, um, here in terms of are anybody, uh, are any family members implicated in the trafficking? Uh, if they do have family members that are part of the trafficking scheme, um, obviously those family members won't be eligible for any type of uh, immigration relief. So if they do have family members that were complicit in this, uh, you would put their names in this section uh, here. And then obviously down here, uh, signature of the law enforcement official um, or supervisor. Judges, obviously, you can just put your name, um, you know, you can put your name anywhere here and just, you know, and obviously you would put down that you're a judge. And then we're just looking for uh, dates here as well. So that's what we're looking for with the T visas uh, or the T visa certification. With the U's, again, um, pretty straightforward. Leslie, I think you were taking over from here. I think it's Laura. Well, we don't have a lot of time to go over the details, so let, let's just quickly take a look at this form and the a couple of things I want to point out. One, if you'll go to the next slide, um, it's pretty self-explanatory, and you can look at the PowerPoint that we're going to send to everybody when we're done, so I commend it to you, along with the handbooks and the other written materials that are available at the websites that are listed in the chat section of your webinar related to toolkits and how-tos and questions that might frequently be answered and so forth. For judges and certifiers, though, a couple of things I want to point out. One, you need to amend the form to say what you need it to say so that it's accurate, if you go to the next one, uh, accurate and uh, comfortable for you to sign it. Because remember, your, your signature means a lot as a judge, and you want the form to say what you're comfortable saying. So if it says, you know, uh, something that you should feel free to amend that form. I think DHS has indicated a willingness to review what you're actually saying, and they understand that judges have ethical responsibilities. So don't hesitate to amend it, initial your change to the form, uh, and just put as much information uh, there to explain what you're doing as possible. I think the, the other big thing I want to tell you about this process is that for me, it's really easy if I simply attach a copy of the order I've entered. Uh, the slide that, that David has up now, for example, is one of the places. Go back to the one you just had. That's the one. You'll see that we drew a line through where it said on behalf of the agency uh, and based on investigation of the facts. Well, judges don't do anything on behalf of agencies, and judges don't 
do investigations. And so this is an example of something that I would suggest that you cross out because we don't investigate. We adjudicate. We listen to evidence. We make decisions, but we don't investigate. So I would simply cross that language out uh, and, and sign it. I think, I think they'll understand. Um, you see just above that where it says, based on my issuance of a protective order. That's going to explain what's going on. I think attaching a copy of the protective order is always a good idea. My suggestion for certifiers that are judges would be to put as much information in the order itself as possible as opposed to the form because nobody can complain about a specific finding you made in an order. No one's going to be able to complain that you were being uh, partial to one side or another or the other by making findings in an order. Family violence occurred. He choked her. You know, I find based on the credible evidence presented before me today on such and such a date that this happened. This is the evidence that I'm basing my order on. You're you're making that you're hearing that evidence, you're making a decision based on that evidence and you're going to put that into an order which reflects what you've done in the context of this uh, hearing that you've had as a judge. That can go easily into your protective order, for example, and that will be the basis of your decision. The fact that DHS or USCIS then evaluates that and finds that to be helpful to them or helpful to somebody else in the process of granting a, a U visa request, great, good for them. But from the judge's standpoint, the point is that you are making findings based on evidence you've heard and you are simply putting that information in an order and nobody's going to be able to complain, I don't think from an ethical standpoint, about your doing your job. So I, I would just remind judges not to worry about uh, that kind of thing. A couple of other sort of ethical points, and David, now if you'll, you're going to have to skip uh, to a few slides to the one that begins. There's the sort of um, cover slide that talks about uh, best practices for, fi for signing U visa certification consistent with canons of judicial ethics because we're, we're going to have to skip a few of the other slides above that. Just a, couple of things on, just a couple of things on, on ethics. Uh, and just let me say, he's, he's skipping slides because we, we don't have a lot of time to go through them all, but I commend them to you because they're chock full of information and, they, and, and a lot of them are self-explanatory. So, so please uh, take, a t take the time when you have it to go through the PowerPoint. But just in terms of judges and the, sort of their ethical responsibilities, uh, there are uh, judicial ethics commissions who are considering this issue. North Carolina has uh, looked at the issue. We think that the North Carolina Judicial Ethics Commission um, decision on this is not complete, really, uh, and we think that they have misunderstood some things, but we would be remiss if we didn't point out to you that there is at least one state out there that does not recommend that judges sign it, and they think that judges should not sign it. Um, I think judges have every right at their discretion to sign it if they choose to. Scott has talked to you at, at some length today about the discretion that judges have, and the federal law is clear that judges are among the individuals that are allowed to certify. I think certification is uh, something that you ought to consider as long as you do so at the right time and in consideration of your ethical responsibility as a judge. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that you're going to make that form say what it needs to say to make it comfortable. That's why I mentioned so uh, first and foremost this, this notion about amending the form. I think you can absolutely main, maintain your impartiality and avoid the, the appearance of impropriety if you stick to what you do as a judge, for example, make specific findings in an order. If you can find probable cause to justify an arrest warrant, certainly you can find probable cause to believe that someone uh, was helpful in uh, an investigation of a crime or that they were a victim of a crime uh, and so forth. I think if you stick to what you do as a judge every day, you won't have any problem being a certifier. So. Um, I just I'd ask you to, to think about what you normally do and do just that. It's just like issuing an arrest warrant in the context of probable cause. Um, ex parte communications. We all of us know that that's an inappropriate thing. Although there are some times when ex parte communications are not problematic. Uh, in a situation where the the ex parte communication is authorized by law, for example, if someone comes to you uh, under your state law in, for a temporary restraining order 
in a brand new lawsuit that's just been ser- that hasn't even been served yet. They've just filed it, but they're entitled to an ex parte uh, protective order, or they're entitled to ex parte relief of some other kind. That obviously, an exception to uh, to this uh, rule. And so you can get information. Um, I want to also point out, just as an aside, that judges can give information. We can't give legal advice, but we can absolutely give information. And so pointing people to uh, resources in the community food stamps, housing, no different than pointing them to the resources that might be available through uh, DHS or USCIS with regard to how they might be safe and better protected in this community uh, by uh, making them, availing themselves of the opportunities that are available through those agencies. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're giving information as a certifier. Um, if you are in the middle of a case, you're going to have to evaluate whether or not that is the time for you to sign the certification. Should you wait until the case is over? Should you wait until the protective order has been uh, finally uh, adjudicated? There, these are considerations. I'm not going to have time to go through each scenario with you this afternoon, but keep in mind that these are the considerations that you as a judge in your discretion will make. And just remember that you just sort of run those traps in your head. Is this the best time to sign it? Should I wait until the end of the process? Should I, you know, should I sign it at the TRO process uh, because this is when it's going to be the most uh, impactful for some reason or another? Those are just the things to be thinking about as you go through this. And obviously the, the center and Scott and others will be available for technical assistance. And I see that people have questions and those questions are being answered uh, by Rocio and others uh, while the webinar is underway. So please, please, please be encouraged to continue to ask those very good questions, and we will provide as much technical support as we possibly can. So again, just look at the toolkit. Think about you know, how this plays out from a practical standpoint uh, for you as a judge. Can I sign it? Should I sign it? Should I sign it now? Should I sign it later? Um, and I think you'll answer in most cases, you'll be able to sign it. I think you'll find yourself more comfortable than you might have thought signing it at certain points in the case. The timing is very important. And so I would just ask you to consider that. Well, hey, and, Leslie, yeah. take, it, take it out, take it on out. Thank you. I really appreciate all of you joining us today and that we hope that this will help answer many questions uh, that people have about judges and U visa certification. Um, Scott and I and New App are available to answer further questions as they come up. And this is a toolkit we've prepared that will help answer questions. It has all the details in it about the forms and how to fill them out. And that we are available to provide direct technical assistance to judges and court staff as well as advocates and attorneys, but judges and court staff under our SJI grant um, to make sure that you have all the information you need and answer your questions on U visas, uh, related to U visas and a variety of other issues. We have lots of materials available on issues that arise for immigrant crime victims um, when they come before state courts. So um, thank you very much for attending today. We will, any questions that we did not have an opportunity to answer during the chat, we will um, do a question and answer sheet that we will distribute. It will be posted on the website along with a live version of uh, uh, this webinar. And we hope uh, we were, uh, this answered some of your questions and we'll encourage more of you to consider signing your visas in the future. Thank you. This will conclude today's um, webinar for New App. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you join us at future New App um, webinars um, on topics related to topics. Thank you to all the speakers, and we will keep the text chat open for another minute. And thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's session.